Good morning, everybody. Good morning, world. Uh, we're all over the place. Let's start with I'm in Kiev. And where, you know, let's go with our panelists. Harsh, where are you? I'm in Aurangabad, India. Okay. Pooja, where are you? Singapore. Singapore. <laughs> and Pankaj? I am in Jaipur, India. India, excellent. Well, again, we have, uh, we should, uh, our additional panels will be joining us shortly from other parts of the world, but this is what is Haras is all about, and I want to welcome you to our panel, which is, uh, you know, caring for others in times of stress. It's a very critical subject and a very timely subject matter, and Haras has always been tackling these big questions uh, that allows us to really uh you know, dive deep into something that a lot of people, I believe, right now are caring about. Uh, and uh, part of this conversation today is not only about identifying areas of stress, and as our panel will go through different areas, but also giving uh, specific recommendations of what we can do in that specific area to help others, uh, uh, you know, and care for others. Uh, obviously, we have a lot of stress across from individual uh, individual uh, psychology uh, all the way to financials, to losing business, to dealing with employers, to take care of your elderly in the country and alike. So for us, this is a very, very uh, deep topic, an important topic for billions of people around the world today. So first of all, I would love to go around right now and simply take about a minute or so to introduce yourself to the world as a panelist, what do you do? Just give us elevator pitch of who you are and what are you all about. Let me start with uh, on my screen with the right corner. We're gonna go clockwise and I'm gonna start with Harsh with you. Please introduce yourself to everybody and tell Harsh what do you do and how you got to harass us. <laughs> so. Thank you, thank you Frank uh, for that question. Well, uh, I am an independent director on a few boards of a few companies here in India. Uh, I also run a podcast called Small Big Wins, where I'm talking to young leaders uh, who have converted their inner calling into something tangible and in the process have solved the problem. And I'm also a leadership and business coach to a lot of industry in, uh, in my city. That is, that is what I'm doing. Earlier, I had a full-fledged corporate life and uh, I moved out early to establish myself. So it is not retiring, as you said, Henry, earlier, it's retiring. That's, great. That's a great way. Uh, all right, it's always got to keep moving. I think that as as older I get, the, the more active I become uh, in many right. different areas. So thank you very much. Pooja, yourself, please. So good morning, good afternoon, world. <laughs> I'm Pooja, I'm from Singapore. Um, I'm actually the founder and CEO of the events, training and development and consultancy uh, company based from Singapore and now in about 16 countries. Um, at the same time, I've also just launched a Cosmos Global Network, which is a network of world visionaries discussing about sustainable development goals all around the world. So the whole aim of that is to actually reach uh, rural communities as well as third world developing or emerging e economies to actually spread about education, um, share knowledge, experiences, and this can be from anywhere. Uh, you can even do it from home, which is, which is the best plan right now. And we've got um, high professionals and C-suite speakers from all of us, something like our races, but the focus is more on actually about sustainable development goals. So we've been in talks with United Nations and we're hoping that sooner or later they'll actually recognize our efforts. And the whole thing is all about social entrepreneurship. So that's where the vision began and it's continuing now as well. Well, so let me, yeah. that's fascinating because as you and I talk, I really hope that your organization will uh, definitely have some impact on Ukraine because it really needs education every and social right. impact. So something we're gonna talk afterwards. Uh, but uh, Pankaj, please, your turn. We can hear you. You gotta unmute yourself. <laughs> yeah. Hello, um, am I audible? Yep. Yes, now we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, my name is uh, Pankaj Gupta, and I am currently the president of IIHMR University. Uh, it is in Jaipur, Rajasthan, the beautiful pink city in India. 
and uh, we are a premier uh, healthcare management research university and uh, we are also engaged into a lot of cutting edge research in uh, transforming the healthcare in india and, and in this part of the world and uh, earlier uh, i have worked briefly in government and uh, also in many other top level institutions in a lot of leadership roles and uh, position like the vice chancellor uh, group ceo and like that and then i also had a lot of stint in the silence silence in the himalayas and uh, earlier my area was mainly the finance and accounting and cost management where i helped and consulted many companies in uh, implementing the activity based costing or other cost management thing but now my area is uh, into self awareness and mindful leadership and uh, that is the kind of work i do day in and day out and uh, primarily with the young students uh, many time you know they are very much uh, into different kind of uh, influences and they are not able to find out what is the seed of possibility they carry within them so i do a lot of uh, such programs for them all over the world and also ceo retreats uh, things like you know the who am i workshop self awareness and mindful leadership uh money to meaning success to significance so these are some of my program thank you money to meaning uh, and i believe yesterday was a yoga day right global yoga day it was yesterday or day before right uh so right on time uh but uh, welcome everybody uh, welcome everybody to this panel uh welcome to harass's uh first virtual meeting and uh, i guess we'll go down in history as the first you know uh, virtual meeting members of uh, this panel and i'm uh, also uh looking forward with that we we getting messages so for everybody who is uh listening to us today uh, if you do have a question to any of the panelists please name who you want to address the question to and obviously provide the question into the chat available to everybody and andrew just said us thank you glad to be here andrew welcome so now let's get to the to, uh, obviously the subject matter at hand uh we have great deal of panelists with a lot of great deal of experience uh in different parts of the world in different industries obviously today uh like no other time in human history we learned uh that we are all connected the virus if there's one positive thing that i can uh, point out uh, that happened through the pandemic uh it is obviously that we all as humanity realize that we all the same boat i think for the first time in human history we can actually say that that we all connected in the way that we talked about in the past but really never came to real feeling of the reality of it and unfortunately this is a negative event of course but it did bring that subject matter at hand so again i'm going to go back and i'm going to start with uh harsh with you because part of the we're going to talk about is what is emotional emotional intelligence there's a many articles written on that emotion as general right now is the such a peak uh, uh, of stress emotion of financial hardship of for some people of the opportunity that's coming with it uh and uh, many other components of emotion that you can put into it so i'd like you to spend next 3 to 5 minutes give our listeners a true understanding what how critical emotion is during the time of stress thank you henry i think uh, what is important is to resilience building is uh, emotional intelligence and particularly to face times of crisis like this um i think throughout the country and it's not restricted to india i think what we have to do is start doing this at a very young age as uh, pankaj was also mentioning some some time before and and it is very important that we start understanding at a young age that we have to accept negative emotions we should not be negating them out we have to be intelligent enough to accept negative emotions so that only if we are able to accept the negative emotions can we access positive emotions so the problem mostly happens is that we are trying to access positive emotions without accepting the negative emotions and that causes a further stress it's a downward spiral so right. yeah so so i think we have to teach our kids now that 
accepting negative emotions is absolutely all right it's absolutely normal there's absolutely nothing wrong about it and then we can try to teach them how to access positive emotions i think this has to become a standard subject as far as emotional intelligence is concerned while this is a part of it but uh you know we I'm sorry to interrupt you here for one second but i need to understand you said it should be subject matter in school how early would you start day care or somewhere the boy no i think i i i think this has to be a complete curriculum all through school this has to be a complete curriculum as there is every subject has different levels of lessons and maturity so does emotions and emotional intelligence also have so i think this is something which we need to start uh at a very very young age probably you know with games in kindergarten and as we grow up coming to a very high and mature understanding of this so let me be more specific in kindergarten when i a kid wants a toy and cannot get it that's a negative emotion right for the kid i cannot get my toy or a candy uh when i'm a teenager i want to get a you know i'm 17 years old i want to have a drink but i cannot have it or my girlfriend broke up with me that's a different level of emotion correct and it's yes. for maturity Okay. Yes. Please yes. continue. And and you know just for the for the benefit of this audience there is a wonderful project for children which is called One Mindful Mind. It was launched before 2 years. It has won more than 20 international award which was designed by an Indian agency. And One Mindful Mind is a wonderful way for children and parents to connect on emotional intelligence. Wow, that's great. So it's more of a family builder as well. Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So I think uh, as far as uh, and the second part in this is emotional intelligence where I think the basic understanding that intellect has to rule over the mind and not the other way around so the basic understanding of discernment of being able to discern between the right and the wrong has to start at an intellectual level and not at the mind level Well so it's separating your uh, intellect from your emotions right so it's a yeah. skill set realizing which I I took in my low, I mean I was a, I'm very temperamental in my youth but I as I got older I started really separating the two when I'm getting like somebody said something that is inside I feel like emotion rising up I got to be able to learn how to slow it down and kick my brain in to respond rationally to the whatever the issue had nailed it Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh but anything else for you anything else Karsh? No I think uh I think you know my panelists uh, are going to build on this because uh, they are also talking about relationships at work and uh, self awareness so uh this is all deeply interconnected Well, so the message, the message that obviously that uh, uh, you're delivering is critical, and especially I think that uh, the the lesson that I would take for it, as we're doing something work in Ukraine now, that this type of have to be built into the curriculum very early on, uh, and also in family education of some sort as well, because obviously kids take a lot from their parents, and if parents are, cannot handle their emotions, they cannot handle their uh, you know emotional intelligence. Let's call it this way, it reflects on the kid. Say yes. very much. Yes, but maybe just just another 10 seconds on this. I think this is also very directly related to the building of self esteem. Yeah, very much so. Which really? get injured in the youth. It and, is and how do you convert negative. negative. Yeah. It's how do you convert the negative uh into the positive? I think that would be the way to summarize what you have said, right? Right. Oh right, great. Uh, thank you very much. We'll come back to that. Pooja, your turn. Let's talk about you wanted to focus on another critical uh, absolutely critical time, you know employee employer relationship during the crisis like this this is a relationship that is always strained why because uh, as i said to many of my employees uh, in the past is as an employer my job to pay you as little as possible and to get as much as possible if i'm driven by financials vice versa you as an employee want to do as little as possible and get paid as much as possible that's during normal times uh, so let's talk about now so thank you for having me as well so i i realized that the employer employee relationship is something that is very crucial at this juncture knowing that most of us are working from home and most of us uh, are struggling to actually make ends meet because there's a lot of retrenchment going on 
So using uh, Singapore's uh, case study as well, there's a lot of companies that are uh, retrenching their workers, but there's a whole um, underlying factor that, that is being missed out, which is actually caring for them. So knowing um, our expectations and understanding how our expectations have an impact on an individual employee and per se, not, not for the entire team, but every um, action or expectation actually has different kinds of impacts on different kinds of employees. Because now understanding that we're actually working from home, there's a lot that goes on that employers would not know about. <laughs> for example, for example, having this call right now, I can have my niece and nephew running through the house, you know, not understanding that this is work because they've not seen you like that in a natural setting. So understanding that whole dynamics that, you know, working from home is not as easy as it sounds. While realizing that um, that's an issue, we also have to understand that employers have actually different groups of people to work with. So the first group, I would say, is actually the experienced and the learned. So these are people that uh, employers actually um, hire to be managers, you know, or team leads or, or whatever not. So these are the learned category, right? There's also the family man, which is the male or female who's actually running a family. And basically, you know, they have to care about the needs back at home. So hence, they are actually working for um, your, your, your company specifically because there's uh, income needed to be brought back home. The third is, of course, the singles, right? So the singles have their own set of problems all, all together. Well, they are easily, um, they can easily shift from industry to industry. They can easily shift from organization to organization because their responsibilities are not as much. Uh, lastly, of course, who's stepping up? The millennials. So the millennials are a whole ball game altogether. Understanding their needs, um, they are, the way they work, the way they understand matters. So these are different kinds of groups of people that employers have to care about. So how do we go about caring is, of course, to understand that um, our expectations don't necessarily have to be the outcome at the end of the day. Because when we try to over expect, you know, there's a lot of pressure that's going on between the employees as well. Um, at the same time, of course, we need to have a clear sense of direction. So if you're focusing on task A, then also remember that while you're retrenching others, the roles that have to be passed on will have to be spread equally amongst the team. So there goes the whole idea of actually over pressure and of course over expectations because the job has to still be done. So knowing where you draw the line between um, one employee to another and understanding the, the forward moving vision of your industry is very important in that sense. The, uh, uh, the Another thing that I wanted to share was about this very hot who topic about neopotism in India. Um, while we understand that, you know, the suicide was um, unfortunate and it was uh, brought about by a lot of chaos about neopotism as well, it's essential to understand that the same way back in your industries, there is no favoritism or there is no hierarchy being played here and that your employees are actually being treated according to their skills, their talents, their hard work, and how much you're actually putting back into the company as well. So understanding that these little small factors can actually play a bigger part is the main, the main aim because caring for people right now, more so when you don't have access to them physically, is harder. And truth be told, it is very necessary for you to check in. Well, Pooja, obviously, this is a critical subject, uh, uh, irrespective of where you live now, what economy you're part of, or what industry you're part of. Uh, we have so many dynamics that uh, are changing now, and a lot of employers and employees, uh, including group dynamics and many other things that matter, uh, is really changing. So, in, in your view, how do you see the future of a workplace uh, that is going to be somewhere of a mix between a physical presence and a virtual presence like we're doing now. Uh, because we can see the implications of that on real estate market, on how we space inside the office, if we, you know, all of that stuff. Right. So, Henry, as for the solutions as well, um, there's been a lot of um, debate going on whether, you know, the work days should be shorter to four days or should we reduce working hours well, those are the two main concerns, but then again, you have to weigh the pros and cons of doing that. If you're not caring for your employees, obviously they feel undervalued, they feel left out. And so taking for granted the whole work from home experience is going to be something that you need to worry about now. Because the more you give to your employee, the more your employee will want to give back to the organization at the same time. It's reciprocal that way. 
they stay where they are respected, they stay where they are supported, they, they stay basically where they are valued, right? So giving that and understanding how we can um, work towards working a solution around it will be very important. So the other thing that I think would work is, you know, um, trying to understand the balance between both and having people check in. So checking in on not just, hey, how are you doing? But actually understanding, you know, is there anything back at home that's going wrong? Is there something that we can help you with as your employer? Because the fact is the fact. We spend more more time thinking about work than we think about things back at home. So so that's how I, I think that would be well, very exciting. The, the, absolutely. But the, we clearly can see, first of all, there's a stats that are coming out now from all over the place. Uh, that uh, remote workers actually have more productivity than in the office, uh, number one. Number two, obviously, if you think about all the corporate policies that were developed for a person physically being there, all has to be changed. Uh, the communication uh, among the team members, for example, you, we all five or four of us being on this call, we never physically met. Uh, but we have established a rapport very quickly uh, due to our professionals and whatever it is uh, in order to have this great conversation. So uh, in, in the last question of this particular segment, in, in, in the view that you have, you know, in terms of this has to be a major work done by three parties or three target audiences. Number one is number one is definitely the employer. And it has to be a very different approach of how to build the morale, how to keep the psychology. Second, which you haven't touched, is there had to be adjustment by the government. Uh, and lastly, which you already addressed a little bit, is the employees themselves have to change how they perceive work. Uh, so talk a little bit about government of work perception by employees. Well, there's one um, from Singapore itself. We've been talking about governments. They've been doing a lot during this whole crisis itself. And there's one very clear example between the government and employers where the government actually gave out job scheme funds. So those companies that were actually earning a lot and were and were having very good high um, turnovers, in the sense where they actually gave out all these payouts, so they they declined future payouts and they gave it back. And this amount of um, seven billion dollars actually went to cover one point nine million uh, local employees' wages. So that being said, you know when you're actually giving back, people understand what your nature is at the same time. But of course, it's all about working together, right? So how the government actually can influence and direct this kind of behaviors, which will then churn out and come back down into the employee's part. It doesn't even have to be your own organization. You're actually impacting thousands and millions of people across. So policies, obviously, right? Because they set a precedence of what to do and how to um, go about uh, following different kinds of procedures. But then again, of course, if, if people do not have those directions from the government then it falls back down to i can do whatever i want to do <laughs> without realizing for ukraine <laughs> yeah, without realizing the bigger impact of how it might actually affect the the employees of different kinds of organizations so i think yeah obviously government's role is important but then again i believe that it also starts with you as an employer and within your own industry. So, you know, you can actually set an example for different kinds of companies to, to see what you're doing and how effective it is. Thank you very much. Great answers. And again, I, I, I was laughing because you said the government, obviously, Singaporean government, America, you can see how much money is being in Ukraine. Unfortunately, we are struggling with a relatively weak government, new government, an exciting government, but does very little for employers or employees, including the government ones, too. So, uh, which is a great segment uh, when you focused on you. Uh, you know, obviously, Pankaj, I would love for you to speak which is a great segue that Pooja just provided for us about self-awareness and the need of it right now to be first and foremost self-aware, irrespective if you're employee, employer, or a government official. Pooja, please. Pankaj, please. Hey, thank you. Um, I think most of the work has already been done by Arji and uh, with your very expert comments. But it's still I'd like to say it small uh, thing, whatever is possible. See, the caring for others at the time of stress, it is the stress or the COVID situation it is not really, uh, or it should not be only the trigger. Somebody who cares for someone will care even at the time of prosperity or even at the time of distress. Because it is a natural being, you know, a sort of person who feel from within to do something. 
and also as bible says it is in giving that you receive uh and same has been echoed by many other uh, scriptures i studied all of them so i know that this is a basic thing that the compassion what we say the karuna empathy these are very much an human quality which already we have we need not to even develop that we need to be just aware about that but what happens once we see that there is no abundance i have to struggle sometime in life and that is how people start becoming somewhat oh you become smart you you know protect your own interest and those kind of feelings are started coming but once a person is start getting some level of self awareness that you are not alone you are part of a bigger universe and it is not only that your action are creating output for you but also so many other elements which are there who are creating your success or your well being and uh, not only the success but the peace happiness all these are very inner being and inner uh, feelings as such so i believe that mainly we are taught told you know that uh, you take care of uh, your business your family and that is good enough i will say there is some merit there because uh, caring for others will only come when you care firstly for your own self because anything which you do not have you cannot give it to anybody else <laughs> so firstly you need to care for yourself and you should be fulfilled first of all and then naturally that what is your area of influence be the family or your organization or your society then you keep on expanding this whole circle and uh, once the people who are little spiritually aware they will that the same light what you have in your heart the same light is also there uh, everywhere it is not only about the human being but the all beings so then you start getting a kind of natural love for the environment around you and you will not harm anything because you know that it is going to harm your own self and your own near and dear so and the very feeling like in india the gods are known as devta d e v t a so devta means somebody who gives de- dene wala the somebody who keep giving so it has been the nature that the gods and goddesses were also known to be somebody who are giving the blessings to you giving something to you so it is very much sort of a divinity thing that if you are able to do something but at the same time again it becomes more of a ego issue when you say i am doing something i am giving and others are receiving again if you do that work with that feeling it is not either going to help you or others so you should know that there is some you know source coming and it is through you it is going to somebody so you become simply an instrument so then your basic thing that i am caring no somewhere the care is coming and you are becoming a good conduct to you know channelize that care for others you channel you channeling that care to others Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think a great example of uh, Pankaj of what you talk about uh, in airlines. Hopefully, we're going to start flying again at some point, uh, where you have to put the mask first on yourself before you can help somebody else. Uh, yeah. Just a great example, and it's a great analogy. I think uh, with number one, if we are focused on ourselves, on our self awareness, it allows us first of all to feel good and strong about ourselves. And as uh, we talked about the harsh about uh, emotions, right? You know, in order for me to help anyone, I gotta feel confident about myself and my ability to help somebody instead of being helpless and seek help. Uh, that's number one. Second thing on the emotion front, also, well, I learned this over the years. Uh, when I'm giving to someone, I I derive enormous pleasure. I didn't realize when giving money away, it gives me pleasure, right? Usually, you, you learn the early one that should be the other way. But uh, please, ca- so continue uh, in that direction because obviously we have to connect the individual uh, to a larger society and probably to the government as well. So maybe okay. um, Pankaj, a couple more words, and I will I'll switch back uh, to Harsh because this is, relates to emotions drastically. Okay, okay. So I'd like to say only a few more things. Uh, So for this, uh, if you want to search these answers in an external world, maybe you will not get it. 
but the people who know what is inner journey what do you get from uh, meditation mindfulness so their consciousness expands and then those people are really in a nature of doing care to others otherwise it is more of only a give and take like you create a school or an organization and where you say it is like this foundation or that foundation i don't want to take any name but uh, that is again your ego is playing not the real nature like if you look at the even in the islam it is said that zakat so when you give any alms to anyone you should not look at that person you should close eyes and give so that you do not know whom you have given uh, and it was mentioned there that if you know you look at the person somebody who is feeling grateful you will develop ego there in this way i can share many other examples but due to shortage of time i will not say that if you see that a child is crying and you go and you know love that child and try to you know wipe the tears and love him or her you will get a sense of great joy so you cannot curse the darkness and also by doing these activity it has been scientifically proven that your dopamine level goes up and there is a joy hormone your eeg levels drops and sometime if you are regularly in the nature of gratitude and passing the gratitude to others uh, your brain waves are also going to reach up to the delta stage that means you are in a eternal bliss all the time so rather than cursing any darkness that people are getting selfish and this and that we should be a lamp and we should it should become naturally that you know the caring and sharing becomes our normal part of life and uh, i want to give one example very small story that once somebody was told that you can experience what is heaven and hell so once that person is taken to the hell and there he saw that people are having so many great uh, food items but people are fighting <laughs> but then what happens they were tied their hand was tied with a very big spoon so they cannot you know move their hand and eat themselves so they were trying to fight and fight then that person was taken to uh, heaven and there they saw the same situation they are also tied with big spoon and they can't eat themselves but what they were doing they were trying to feed others they cannot and other was feeding them it is always about the mutual love and that kind of co caring that create a very big difference so during this covid time i will have just very one key message you know you may keep calculating oh, how many people should i have how many you can fire and all that but respecting those constraints try to run it run the business more as a family at this time not really running like a business like a profit churning machine um obviously it's very very hard in this times for the business owners to make those adjustments run as a family uh, i i think that in my experience a firing employee irrespective of how bad he or she did whatever is always extremely emotionally difficult for the uh, owners or founders of companies or CEOs uh, uh but uh, i am harsh of coming back to you and then we got have a couple of questions i think some of them would be addressed to puja is uh, talk about the emotions in respect to what other two panelists talked about because i think uh, it's all about emotions yes i think uh, across the board life skills have to take a precedence over vocational skills and and interpersonal relations emotional intelligence understanding the basic idea of self awareness this all has to take precedence and and to build on what both the panelists said you know corporates have to move away from being a corpo rat <laughs> the rat race the rat race which they create and most of them even today in spite of lot of information and examples being available focus only on shareholder value that is the only meaning they can give to the business so i think i think they have to move on from shareholder value to a more meaningful purpose where they have uh, the entire workforce involved and i think if it's never before we have had an opportunity that we all can really be into what you call hashtag #truly human leadership well well i i think there's a major movement that actually something i am very much proponing uh, 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 pushing in ukraine is stakeholder economy is when you care not just for your profits but we want to bring companies out of india and singapore into ukraine and the first thing they will want them to do is to build daycare schools 
in order for to demonstrate the goodwill to the community. Uh, and I think, Puja, as we get into it, this is part of the social responsibility you're pushing as well across the world because the corporates can come in instead of demanding tax breaks and all that shit. They can only come in and say, hey, we're gonna, let's build a school, let's build a sports facility for the medical facility, whatever. Uh, for the And then that would be much bigger benefit, a long-term benefit for the corporates themselves. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Pooja, getting back to you, first of all, we have a question for you, two of them. Uh, today, Indian Minister for Commerce and Industry spoke against payouts or leniency in any stat statutory dues. How do you compare Indian approach versus Singapore? I think it's I hard think to compare, size country size-wise. <laughs> so, yes. I think, firstly, it is definitely hard to compare in that sense because it also comes back down to the country's reserves. Why we're actually able to do that is because our geographical scale, our population size, and the efficiency to which we can carry it out, where data is so accessible within one small little dot on, on the map, it is much more uh, easier that way. But if you're comparing it to handouts, okay, let's just talk about payouts and handouts itself. Well, it's not as though we don't have criteria to meet this payout. There are, there are tons of criteria that are actually set in place. And if you do not qualify for the criteria, you do not get the payout per se. But if you're talking about uh, what, I, what I was sharing earlier, I, I was talking more about how we can actually do things ourselves rather than waiting for the governments to actually come up with laws and legislations. So in that sense, we have all our own uh, roles, like how... Um, uh, Dr. Bunker shared as well about your own self awareness, your your own uh, doings. Well, if you if you've already um, decided to run a company in an organization and know that you are supposed to be responsible for ten thousands whatever people, then you have to put in places where you know your employee welfare is also met. So understanding that you know how much can you take on your plate. How much is it that it, that is okay that you know you will be able to predict your your four runs or your next runs or your next turnovers? It's under uh, important to understand that. So it works just like a country's reserves, right? Because you know how much money you have on hand. Well, that being said, of course, our practices start from from our own organizations. So there is also another question about the stress, right? So how do you manage that? Is basically when you start implementing measures yourself. Having people check in or having your team leads or training them with life skills, which is what uh, Harsh mentioned as well. Life skills training is something that we do a lot in Singapore. So if you're comparing it to India, I don't know the scale of what it's being done, but I'm sure it has proven to done, uh, have a lot of other uh, impacts because now people are not just having business skills, but they're having people skills. And people skills revolves around caring for others mainly, right? It involves empathy. It involves uh, concern. It, it involves even support in that sense. So doing what you can from your own organization is essential. But you've got to understand as well because different organizations work differently. What is your main aim at the end of the day? Well, so well, understanding that. Pooja, I apologize. But I think there's also, uh, as you were speaking, I was thinking about there's a cultural context to it, right? Uh, in America, you know, I spent 30 years living a little life in America. It's very self-centered about the individual uh, versus Indian or Asian community in general about the community, right? Uh, when you live in, uh, right now, I'm in a former Soviet bloc, and it's about the state in a way, right? And it's transitioning somewhere. I think there's a mix somewhere between uh, true individualism and uh, true, like, uh, it's all for the community, right? Somewhere there's got to be a mix, uh, uh, and I hope to we can show this in Ukraine at some point. Uh, but uh, the other quick question before I get back to um, uh, Pankaj uh, is the number one is uh, how I don't even know what those uh, uh, acronyms are. How do CXO and CHRO is accountable in best practices? Which is probably to you because I'm not familiar with those acronyms uh, myself. Um, no, I, I'm not very familiar with that as well. Maybe he's talking about the C-suite levels. I, uh, I would say, I would think the human resource team. Uh, I have no, but maybe with uh, Pankaj, uh, the, the, yes, go ahead, Harsh. No, I just wanted to pitch in here saying that, you know, HR is not human resource. It has to be human relations now. What? Beautiful. <laughs> Actually, I think the human resource is such a bad label. Uh, yes. And I've been thinking about it for a long time. I think yes. that human resource, their function would be completely different 
after pandemic versus, hey, just giving you raises or giving you reports of how you did, which is a very degrading in itself. Yes, and uh, obviously, Pankaj, to you, please. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to say that uh, when you talk about the CHROs, uh, what uh, uh, Harsh has already said, that it was a human relations. Uh, but, you know, that those people also, how self-aware they are. Because most of the time it happens that they know I need to just get this KRA, KPI, milestone deliverables. And then they handle people in a very clinical way. So they have to really having this kind of real care. Uh, and also the competency mapping and then giving the right thing to right person. And a genuine care, which you know the employees can always feel. So I'd like to say that uh, the basic life skill and self-awareness also have to be learned so much by the HR professionals. Because it is not always uh, command and control, my way or highway. The whole world is changing so much. So the formal authority, in place of that, there is more of the moral authority. Where you do not have any option to fire people, is still how you can engage with them and get the things done with them. Yeah, yeah. and I also think the culture that we spoke about for India and Singapore, I think it's not about the culture differences, but it's the culture of the workplace that makes a whole lot of difference because we have a lot of India companies here in Singapore too. So so the whole culture aspect is different from what you're actually trying to build a culture around the workplace. If you allow it to be a place that's that's comfortable for your employees, it's a healthy environment, then of course, you know, the cultures are, of a workplace are molded by your own, uh, your decisions and, and whatever you try to employ for your own company. So cultures, I think people are very smart nowadays to adapt and to actually um, be able to be um, working in a team per se. But the idea that they need to understand what is the culture of the organization I'm planning to get into makes more of a more of a sense to me. Yes, thank you. Um, and um, I will, first of all, I Pankaj, our uh, person who, you know, he wrote a bunch of messages uh, into the chat. Thank you for that. Thank you for contributing to the conversation. Uh, but I, I think that, um, Puja, you addressed something very interesting, which is uh, goes on top of what Pankaj had said. Uh, and I think that we are now live in a global environment, right, uh, where pretty much wherever you go, India, Singapore, America, Europe, you see a very large mix of personalities, of uh, cultural mix, uh, background mix, whatever, religion mix, and so on. So the idea behind it that pretty much any company from startup to multinational corporations must very much take a whole different approach to the development of internal culture within corporate environment based on the uh, based on the mix back as they get all the time now. Right. Of individuals. So um, first of all, I want to thank you all. And uh, before we, we have about a minute or so, a minute and a half left, what I'd like to do in the last minute is to point out two things. Uh, and then I'll give you last word, guys. Number one, uh, the pandemic is clearly shook everybody up, which is a positive thing to start really thinking about different ways of doing things versus the one we've done for decades. And we see what's happening in America with race issues uh, is a, one of those indicators. It's been bubbling for years. The bubble is burst now. And I think we're in a very, you know, probably next 12 to 18 months transition period on many different verticals. Number two, I want to, I think that everything we address today uh, is critical because it's a component. Every one of your, uh, you know, topics were a component of overall uh, human relationship uh, issues, and not human resources, but human relationship issues. So last words, you know, 50, 10, 15 seconds each. We'll start again with Harsh and we'll go, go ahead, Harsh, your last couple of words for our audience. We have actually okay. yes. 60 focus. <laughs> yeah, focus on the intangible, the tangible will come. Beautiful. That was less than 15 seconds, another five seconds. For, no, just kidding. So, uh, Puja, please. Well, I think we shouldn't just care for each other in times of stress, but care for each other always. <laughs> Beautiful. And Pankaj? The power within us is much greater than any challenges which is in front of us. Beautiful. That's what we got. I, I can't beat any of <laughs> So I'm going to thank you all. And I want to thank all of our audience and people who listen to us. Thank you very much. I want to thank Dr. Richter from Horasis for not giving up 
and putting this India meet up on the schedule, uh, adapting to the new funds. So thank you all, and till next time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.